Thank you for tuning in to the World Builders Anvil, episode 226. Let's build a gnome race. They don't sound that way. Don't know where to start building your fantasy world? Do you need more? Does it make sense? Forget any worries and become a crafter of imagination. This is the place where we will prime your mind. Now, it's time to heat up the forge, break out the mithril ingots and hammer. Welcome to the World Builders Anvil. I'm Jeffrey W. Ingram. And I'm Michael Miller. Let's sup from the muck of Java and build. Welcome back. I'm Jeffrey. No, I'm going to stop. <laughs> I could just see our downloads decreasing to zero. If oh, I yeah. I don't think that voice would go over as well as my pirate. Did you ever see the uh, Mel Brooks movie that takes place in Poland during World War II? Uh, I'm aware of it. Or not I, have, to I haven't seen it. The whole like first like several minutes, they're speaking gibberish, but they're calling it Polish, and they have English subtitles. Mm-hmm. And then like they just like an announcer stops and goes, "Okay, for people's sanity, we're going to stop doing that. The rest of the movie will be in English." Just <laughs> a very good classic moment there. One of those Mel Brooks moments. Um, yes, and for the audience, I'm Jeffrey W. Ingram, and infinitely yours. I am Michael Miller. Infinitely, that's infinitely, a, and I say I that wish quite, I was infinitely quite purposefully. So I have been going crazy lately because I saw uh, the new Avengers: Infinity War and watched Thanos, uh, you know, show up on screen. And I won't spoil anything here. Mm-hmm. But I, I immediately got a hold of Jeff and I was like, we have to do like a bonus episode and talk about Infinity War and it'll be spoilerific because I need to tear this whole thing down and tell everybody why it's awesome and why it sucks. And Jeff is not going to get to see the movie for a while, so <laughs> we're not going to get the chance to do it in a timely fashion. So mm-hmm. I, we're either going to do it later or Jeff is encouraging me to put up videos on the Facebook page. So I might actually do that but yeah, i've got and I just like so pick, many... one, pick one idea and kind oh of... my god i got like i've got out i've got like two hours worth of ideas well, i'm saying but just like, do one at a time you know you don't have to i know i know it's just it's driving me crazy some of the things that occur in that movie and and, and how they go about it so, so okay. good and bad uh, good and bad there's there are some moments in that movie that are what did i just do i just made a loud noise i'm not sure how so overall, so I can put uh, 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 this in, in, in the show notes and get a little search engine love from it, <laughs> even though it's really not related to the episode. Uh, overall, what is like on a scale of one to four? On a scale of one to four, like how good is the movie? How good, how good would you say was your overall impression? On a scale of one to four, four being the best, it's a four. I mean, it's totally <laughs> worth It's totally worth watching. It's, it's, it's great. And there are some epic moments that have taken all these years to build the, there would have those to, moments. Yeah. Exactly. But they also do some things that I think are so stupid that I'm just like, really? Like, seriously? Like, <laughs> that's what you, that's what you're going with? Mm. Like you, you've, you've done all these wonderful things in all these other great Marvel movies. And this is th- the crowning jewel so far. Mm. And it just it's there were some missteps that I thought were were obvious. Well, the missteps we will place on whoever did the last Star Wars movie in the trilogy. Well, the other thing is the missteps could also be, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. Like it could be they did them that way because further down the road it's going to be different in retrospect. Which fine. But there's a couple of things they did that I'm just like, come on, like really? So, and there's yeah. and there's and there's one thing that I've been watching tons of videos and reading tons of articles, and nobody I I have yet to see a single opinion that is seeing it quite the way I saw it. Mm-hmm. I see a lot that are close, but not quite that have. There's one moment in the movie where I'm like, everyone seems to be focusing on one particular thing about it, and I'm like. How is nobody picking up on this thing that I'm picking up on? Or at least nobody is stating it in any of the stuff that I've read or yeah. watched. So I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to say right now, and I won't say the exact person, there was a death I saw in a quick trailer because the, this business show I watched in the morning was going to talk about it because when it first launched open and they revealed a death. And now I've seen that death coming since the character was introduced, so I'm not going to even get into the specifics. But I would have been pretty upset if I had been a um, 
if I had wanted to see it and I wasn't familiar at all with right. what it means having an Infinity War. Yeah, uh, so. Je- Jeff and I both read the Infinity Gauntlet series many, many years ago. And, and it, it was followed up by the Infinity War as well. Right. But so this is more about the Gauntlet. This is more, Iron they're calling Infinity. it Infinity War, but it really is the Infinity. It really is the story of the Infinity Gauntlet. Okay. So anyway, um, today we're talking about gnomes. <laughs> Okay, so it's gnomes. So when I think of Thanos, I think of gnomes. Gnomes, of course. Um, if you haven't been paying attention, this is part two of uh, a gnome series that we're doing. So last episode, we talked about the framework of a gnome culture that Jeff has mm-hmm. in his world, but he has not fleshed out yet. And today, we are really going to start adding some sinew to this puppy. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I think, you know, when you deal with something like gnomes, you got to kind of think <clears throat> stereotypes. This is something that shows up a lot in games. It shows up a lot in fiction. Stereotypes. Um, yeah, like like what's your impression of a gnome? Because uh, okay. whenever you're dealing with a race that exists in other fiction, uh, one, you have to be careful to make sure that it's it's bigger than that fiction. It's existed longer. And a lot of times, especially in fantasy, they take things from actual mythology. So a lot of times, specific names are actually from lore. Mm-hmm. But, you know, sometimes... And I, by lore, you mean, you mean real-world lore. Real-world lore. But, like, you know, certain terms like Hobbit, you know, are... They're made up from things, but they have a unique name. So you got to sometimes be a bit careful in what you call something because you might actually get into intellectual property violation. If it comes from mythology, like the term elf, dwarfs, no, these things have been around for a really long time. I was about um, to ask, where, where do you know the first um, use of gnome? Uh, hold on, let's do a quick Google search here. Uh, we don't need. I was a yes or no question. The answer is no. If you need to do a girl Google search, the the listeners can do a Google search too. <laughs> no, they cannot. Uh, that, they they awesome. can't do that because there's nothing more interesting than listening to you Google search. <laughs> While Jeff's well, doing I know you that, do live for my Google search. I do. Well, I do it on the show too, but what I encourage is for you to keep chatting while while I do a search in the background or whatever. Well, so, I'm trying to encourage you to chat because I, I am. I if you, think, you keep talk. cutting me off, so, you know. Because I guess I can talk as long as it's annoying you. Right. And it always does. I don't know why I still do the show. So <laughs> yeah, It actually goes back to the 18th century. 18th that's not that well actually even further back than that there are some possible origins before that to like the 1500s uh it's not that long ago so relatively new yeah relatively i think it's new. sort of derived off of older things like brownies um and fairies kind of led to a lot of stuff and mm-hmm. alplins and then mishmashing of things over time um i think all kind of led to it but it's more of the comes out of the romantic period of uh fairy tales or where gnomes really start showing up couple quickies to keep in mind about Jeff's gnomes and really about Jeff's um, races in general. Jeff's races in generals, like they, in generals, yes, I said that, uh, they they fall into what you expect a race to be, mm-hmm. except, but kind of. I mean, like Jeff yes. puts these really nice personalities into his races where they feel familiar but then you start to get to know them and they're very different than what you would know as these are what goblins are in a regular fantasy say, setting or these are what elves are these are what mm-hmm. you know whatever it is like he puts these great great spins and they usually tend to be in the cultural aspect mm-hmm. so quick recapping on what we have on gnomes so far they were an enslaved race mm-hmm. they exodus away from where they were uh, captives, you know, mm-hmm. uh, they, they were being held by the dwarves. They did. So they, they have a xenophobic outlook on other races altogether. And when they left the area they had been, they went across, uh, presumably a frozen land bridge to what eventually becomes an Island. So they are an isolated culture away, physically isolated and also culturally isolated from other races on his planet. But here's the kicker. They're technologically advanced, like if you're familiar with the term tech level, and if you listen to the show, you should be. They're like two tech levels above everybody else on the planet. And to put that in perspective, uh, the the first stories I want to be coming out with in Garduel take place in the Iron Age. So sort of before, you know, sort of like think of like the Roman era. Uh, There's no uh, dominant empire like that in this part of the world. 
but it's heavily focused on one culture who's in the Iron Age. Most of the world is in the Iron Age. I think about a little bit more complex than that because I think of agriculture and all sorts of things. But the overall uh, level would be essentially Iron Age Earth. So they use iron weapons, uh, and that's about as far as they progressed um, and the ability to farm and that kind of stuff. The gnomes would, at that period of time, essentially be in the Renaissance era. So think about Renaissance Earth, where you have the three musketeers, gnomish style, uh, coming down, whipping the butt, you know, of like a bunch of these barbarians uh, without culture or class from Bedrakia. I mean, come on, those Bedrakians don't have a chance. Roman soldiers would show up with their advanced technology, their their fantastic armor and their shiny new swords, and the gnomes would pull black powder firearms out. Mm-hmm. Imagine, really imagine that the, the distinct, <laughs> the huge technological gap mm-hmm. in the, in those in those races. So the gnomes, the gnomes are are very unique to Jeff's world, and he's wa- he's wanted it this way for a while, but hasn't fleshed it out. So, and that's the interesting thing is because like Michael's played in my world, he's had experience, he's heard about gnomes in those experiences he i don't think he's ever experienced one probably not because he no not not firsthand no but but it's like and and this is where frameworks are important too right there's a just from the few ideas i talked about in the last episode his his feeling through the 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 frame that i shared was that this was a completely fleshed out thing oh yeah i i thought that you had a whole backstory and history and everything for these Mm -hmm. and it's all based on having a solid frame, you know, Mm -hmm. and we've talked about this so many times, but like, I I always, I'm happy to repeat it is that the idea that Jeff had was solid enough that he could present it in a fashion that to me, it seemed completely fleshed out. Mm -hmm. So when he told me, he's like, Oh, we're going to make a gnome gnome culture. I'm like, what do you mean? I'm like, you have like a gnome culture. He's like, well, I kind of do. I'm like, what do you mean you kind of do? I'm like, I thought they were this like super race. And he's like, well, they are. (laughs) But I don't. What? But, I don't, but I don't know them yet. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know them yet. Beyond that, you know, and it was so funny too because we started off with a vehicle, and then he's like, "We should talk about the culture." I'm like, "I don't have one." So then it's like, "Well, we better really let's build one." And it went from one episode to three because I really don't have stuff here. Um, but I want to show too. I could have built the vehicle knowing just what I know now, mm. because it's just enough to get the ideas and what's important to the people, mm. what they would have and think is important. Yeah. But are we going to do a vehicle in another episode? Like, you don't want to get into that now. Well, that'd be the next episode. Okay, fair enough. So you had started off with talking about stereotypes and gnome stereotypes. Mm-hmm. Do you only want to cover what a viewer, reader, um, avatar, or world builder is going to approach as a stereotype for a gnome? Or do you also want to talk about stereotypes of other cultures Two gnomes or gnome, the way gnomes look at others, other cultures. This is strictly an avatar's stereotype of a gnome. And because you're the ultimate avatar, that's that's what Michael is on the show. I what take that as such impression? a high, What do you think of when I say a gnome? High, high compliment. I take that as a very high compliment. Um, for me, when, I, when you say gnome, of course, you cannot hear the word gnome without thinking of garden gnomes. Mm-hmm. So I also when the visual of a garden gnome comes to mind, it immediately takes me to golden ax in golden ax in between levels. And occasionally during the level gnomes would run into the field of battle and you could kick them or swipe at them, attack, uh, swipe attack at them and they would drop magical potions. So to me, you know, from a child's growing up with that being a gnome exposure, I, I view them as a magical race. I expect mm-hmm. them to be, um, mischievous, uh, but f- from other things that have come along the way that the idea of them being mischievous, you know, fell by the wayside. And I think of them more as kind of, uh, wise yet playful, you know, kind of a, a hobbit like in that they're probably much older than they look, but they also behave much younger than they look. Yeah. I, um, want, I think my impression, and tell me if, if this is kind of where you're getting at, you know, I think it, it especially like the, probably the last 10 years, they're kind of like mad scientists. Um, um, well, that's, that's something like 
I would, I'm kind of like sharing my avatar perspective through, through time. So mm-hmm. I would eventually get to that. Like if you, t- if you, if you say gnome and steampunk, I would immediately go with like a Dr. Frankenstein t- type of character with a bunch of beakers and, mm-hmm. you know, some, some, some big visor that, you know, is protecting his eyes while he does some, something in a lab. Mm-hmm. Um, there are, there are games that I play that absolutely deliver gnomes that way. And, mm-hmm. and, and, and that works for me. Like I'm, I'm totally cool with that. I get that. But I also, I can also see dwarves being that way in that setting as, as well. And I definitely have a distinct personality difference between those two races. Mm. So, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I think that's pretty much for my interaction with fiction. That's kind of, they said they start off as like these mischievous uh, uh, sort of garden gnomes, as, as you would say. Mm-hmm. And I think to even more recently, if someone's seen Troll Hunters, that's a great example. You know what? I've uh, had that movie sitting in my queue for, I'm, I'm not exaggerating, maybe five years. And I have a series you, that you need to watch. I have, I think I have watched it with see, very low expectations. Series? I thought there was only one movie. There's more than no. one. It's a. I thought it was a movie too. It's a series. I think there's two seasons. I thought it was a singular feature. No. Oh yeah, I got to get on that then. And, and there might be something with a similar name because I know there's a Swedish movie I think called Troll Hunter. Well, then that is what I'm thinking. That's of. what. Because this is animated I'm, from DreamWorks. Oh, this is what I'm talking about. Is not animated. And, it is, it's live. And action. I went in with very low expectations. And was blown away, but they actually essentially they have garden gnome styled gnomes, uh-huh. uh, but it's like their own little twist, and it kind of goes back to I think more of a older look of gnome. Oh, I do know what you're talking about, and also was thoroughly unimpressed with its marketing. So I was not interested in it at all. But you're saying it's a deeper than it. Looks. I was not interested until I started watching it. Okay, it was just like one of those where I wasn't feeling good. I'm like, let me just I'm just gonna click this on and. And I, oh, I started watching, I stopped, my wife and I power watched two seasons of it. <laughs> so I'll, I'll give it a try on your say so, but I am referring to the, the Swedish movie. And the reason I have not sat down to it is because every time I've had a moment where I wasn't, you know, prioritizing something else to watch, mm-hmm. I didn't feel like reading it because it is mm-hmm. a foreign film. Yeah. Yeah, I understand. I've had the same problem with that movie too, which is what I started to think when we were having that conversation. Hmm. That's Troll Hunter versus Troll Hunters, I believe. Um, I believe you're correct. <clears throat> now, uh, appearance. Uh, I think, you know, and this is one of the things Jeffrey has two variations of how he twists things. Mine is more in uh, sometimes it's like a big change, like my halflings versus halflings you've ever met. Um, uh, will are they're radically different. So uh, typically, and this is from a, my storytelling perspective, when I introduce something like that, I, I talk about them and add adjectives that people wouldn't expect, mm. like fear. Mm. Yeah, yeah, halflings you are know, scary. And you're don't wrong. screw with halflings. You don't screw with halflings. Most people who know of halflings in modern fiction are like they think of them like hobbits. Mm. And um, which is perfectly <laughs> simple. I love halflings that way. I love Le- I less love, less threatening than hobbits, <laughs> but maybe less threatening. Yes, uh, possibly more addicted. Um, but uh, mine, like I said, their name came out of what happened, which created the gnomes and dwarves. And they're a little shorter than humans too. Not nearly as much as mm. as uh, t- typical halflings are. They're about five foot if they're well fed, um, mm. and so they're about um, a foot shorter. Let me ask you a quick question about appearance, because when I think mm-hmm. of appearance, are, are you strictly talking about their physiology or are you also physiology? Talking, okay. Then I'll ask in a second. Cause I was going to uh, talk about their clothing. Well, to me, that's more of a cultural thing. And well, of course, but it definitely falls into appearance. If you're just using the word generically, uh, using the word generically, but remember when I talk about races, I separate it in this circumstance, they happen to be tightly coupled. Um, but you know, for me, cultures are something larger than races. So, uh, um, you know, early on races might be individual cultures, but over time they kind of grow. They, they, they have all these outside influences. Gnomes outside of their very beginning don't have outside influences. Maybe, um, they might in a different way. Uh, now, um, but physiologically speaking, I'm thinking about them very much in the traditional sense of probably under four foot tall. Mm. 
between three and four foot tall, I'm going to say. How, uh, how, how tall are your dwarves? About the same. Well, so maybe you, a little taller. Maybe okay. Because for me, I would put gnomes way shorter, but you're going to put them closer you know, to dwarves. Yeah, size. you put two to three feet. I think that's just a little too short. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, about half the size of a human is pretty damn short. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, probably, but like, once again, four is well fed. So four would be like, think of a hobbit in modern day when you have really good access to food, you have perfect nutrition, mm-hmm. um, or maybe not perfect, but you get enough calories that your body isn't held back. Mm-hmm. Um, so probably, you know, even in this period, probably still more around the three foot size. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, hair. You are know. they, are they squat? Are they, are they stocky the way you'd expect a gnome yes. to be? Okay. Yes, I visually I, I want them pretty much what people would expect. So they're mm-hmm. going to be sort of squat, a little bit of a belly, very non-threatening to look at individually. Mm-hmm. Now, whenever I talk about races, you know, we're talking about the stereotype of the race, and, and there are deviations. But uh, in general, squat. Some of the more soldierly ones wouldn't be, but they would actually. Soldiers don't have a. a it's not as uh, prestigious in gnomish culture. Um, Nomus culture is about, you know, the biggest, the wealthiest, the most important people are all really bright. It's as we talked about before, the best and the brightest get promoted within the culture. So typically cultures try and have the traits of other people. Glasses would probably be important as a status symbol, because even if you don't need them, you want glasses because if you read a lot, over time, you're going to need glasses. So it's probably a very common thing to have throughout our glasses, which would be very new for them now. Let me um, point out the concept of a gnomish soldier for a second. If they've been super isolated from the world, would they even have soldiers? Yes, because of the mythology of the dwarves. And if they have this fear, the dwarves are coming. Okay. And even over time, even though they don't, they have a very rigid military. One, they have had boats come close. Okay. We've made it all the way to the island. Uh, that's an invasion. Your little fishing boat in our waters, that's an invasion. Um, and so they would respond and try and kill everyone. Um, they don't mess around. <laughs> <laughs> Any other things about appearance? Do they have um, uh, specific uh, racial uh coloring or like like are gnomes only dark skinned or only light skinned or are they brightly colored skinned like um I, i'm gonna shoot they're they're based off of diet which is the current leaning for the cause of skin tannin mm-hmm. it's based off of food consumption it would probably be, uh uh probably be slightly darker uh than white but more uh closer to white okay uh, so uh think uh uh, East Asian, um, where okay. it, it can still get relatively dark, but there's still this tendency towards paleness in that. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, because what I, what I was gonna, skin issues as well because of that. This um, this 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 does lead this kind of doubles back on the question that I was going to ask before about appearance and about uh, the island because I was going to ask about clothing, but it kind of blends into this as well. What kind of islands are these? Are they like tropical islands? Are they like islands near a colder area? Like that's going to lend a lot to how they live and who they are. It, it lends a huge amount. So essentially, the way I like to say it, it's like sort of take like uh, uh, Taiwan and Sri Lanka and shove them together. So okay, so it's warm. You got tropical style there's, vegetation. There's tropical at at at, at at, at sea level, mm-hmm. but there's pretty significant mountains within the island. Okay, so, so you, you actually develop. have a temperate zone as well. I was just going to say that. I was going to say you've got a, pr- well, a pretty significant variety of of uh, of. Uh, you're going to have yeah. the tropics type of weather, so you're going to have a monsoon season, uh, a, essentially wet and dry instead of summer and winter. Mm-hmm. Um, you're going to have a wet and dry season. Um, uh, and uh, the cooler season is still going to be great weather mm-hmm. uh, just because of where it's located. The temperate zone is probably an awesome place to live. Um, but and, it's probably going to be misty because of all of the moisture that accumulates below. So you're probably going to have lots of mists higher up around the island. So from a, it'll help actually uh, hide the hide the, 
because you'll, it'll be very misty because the temperate zone, all the warm, moist air from below will start condensating at a certain level. And so you'll have pretty thick clouds and then it will be mist rolling down. So I imagine um, just based on what we have as an idea for them that they're going to explore all that and there's gnomes up there too. Oh, yes. They, 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 you know, in the time period, in this Iron Age time period, they have complete dominance over the, over the island. Okay. Uh, and uh, they control every inch of it. They live interiorly. Um, they live inside of the mountains, though. So, okay. um, so their homes would be burrowed into mountains. Uh, roads would be internalized, not externalized, because um, once again, I think that's due to the xenophobia, right? Mm -hmm. If you have roads and trails on the surface, um, especially at the lower levels, it looks like people live there. Mm -hmm. So higher up in the mountains, there are external stuff, but lower down, it's going to be very um, – uh, no trails and stuff like that, or very few. It'll be more like – think of a, a – more like visiting a tropical island with a tribal group living there. There are going to be maybe some paths through there and stuff, but nothing formalized. But the hunters who are hunting for food down there, they're – they are going to typically use the same path because they know there's good game here and there's good game there. So over time, there will be a little bit of paths that build up, but it's going to look very under civilized and, uh, and desolate of sentient beings. If you were to land on the beach, which would be lucky. Did we on talk on this show in somewhere in the South Pacific, there is an Island, um, or actually it might be like Southeast Asia, not even in the South Pacific. Um, there is an island, I believe, even now, I believe in modern time, that has an unexplored, like, tribe. Mm -hmm. Like, there, there, there is a big people living on this I island. I can think of at least one, yes. That is still not um, spoiled by modern technology. It, like, they are, they are a tribal people, and anyone that has landed on, on the island... Is killed is immediately like they're killed right on the beach. Like they don't even, even to the point where if you fly closer than a helicopter or a boat, uh, they will try and attack you. Yeah. They're so very, they're, they're very, they're very aggressive. Helicopters, they will use probably uh, canoes. I'm assuming and go after boats that get too close to be like, Hey, no. And they kind of get that there's this big population and they, I think they kind of get at a distance, but like you said, um, and I think it, I'm saying Indonesia, but I'm not positive. That sounds familiar. But I, I've definitely heard of this exact place, and there might be more than one. I don't know. But mm. there's definitely one specifically. Maybe we talked about on the show before, too. I'm not I sure. think we have. I, and part of me wants to think they're cannibal, cannibalistic, like whoever comes on the beach gets killed and, and cooked up on the beach. I think. I might be making that part up. It's been a while since well, I've it makes I, a good I, story. I want to say I read an article. But my point is, your gnomes sound similar except that I would believe that they're smart enough that like if somebody's coming along that if they think they're going to come to the Island, they'll lay in wait to make sure that they ensure that whoever comes never gets a chance to leave. It would be very important for them to make sure that when they attack, it is a final like said it's, yeah, it's, it's a decisive victory. They're not trying to let people get back to say, Oh, don't go there. They don't even want that. Uh, so a little bit more extreme than that island and having the higher technology makes it a little easier on them. Right. All right. So, um, so we got their appearance down and we're talking a little bit about some, some cultural aspects. What, what, what traits would you like, what, what do you think about them? When you think about these gnomes, what comes mm -hmm. to mind? So, and when I use traits, the way I like to think about it is there might be very common traits, like half the people might have it. I don't count that as a racial trait. It has to be one of those things like say in, in humans, like vision, vision is a human trait. Okay. Now some people are born totally blind, but that's, that's rare. Mm -hmm. uh, but so you could say, but a normal human trait is vision is hearing is the ability to speak. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to get into that kind of granular stuff, but I just want to explain to people that there are certain things that are more likely uh, the not, but they don't necessarily, they don't make it as a, a racial trait. Now to go into that, they, they have, they have a form of, uh, night vision. Okay. Um, and a good one, uh, they would need to be able to see inside, uh, 
their their land. They don't need light reflection to do it. It's their their eyes allow them to see. Uh, now that leads into a natural limitation of they're probably not great uh, with their vision during the day. It's one of those things where typically that skill uh, hurts typically. Mm-hmm. So they're probably they probably can see during the day. And their vision is probably better at night than during the day. It's probably weaker than an average human's during the day, better than an average human's, or as good as an average human at night. Now, does that lend itself to getting back to them wearing glasses? Do they invent sunglasses? They probably s- have sunglasses. Not at this time yet. Not yet. Um, uh, maybe through magic. There's probably, I would say there's probably something yeah. uh, to help with that. Uh, they do have glasses. Um, glasses are important. Most of their vision issues are are reading related. So it's like reading glasses mm-hmm. um, uh, are probably the most common form of glasses to help when your eye gets tired after reading typically as you get older the more you read the more you use your eyes they start to wear out they start to get tired i also think of gnomes as being a nimble race are your gnomes like that or are like are they quick are they slower you know like i would, yeah. I, would think no, I think they're a little slower yeah yeah i think okay. you know i mean pound for pound it's equivalent to human so mm-hmm. it's 50 percent. <laughs> right right <laughs> yeah. Um, which is definitely another limitation of theirs as well, too. Um, they, they have, uh, a, a racial sense of, um, and, and, and we talked about this and I, I kind of decide that this is the way I want to go with them. Community, they're community focused, mm-hmm. um, you know, where humans are more individually focused, even though they're community based, uh, gnomes are the opposite. Gnomes would be a good socialist. I was about to say they've got a more social socialistic mentality. Yeah, exactly. Um, so they definitely racially go that way. Um, uh, they also have a better than average intelligence uh, racially, and they have a high tendency, not racially, but a high tendency of geniuses. So probably about 15% of the population would be IQ-wise genius which is much larger. You think like they're, they're, you know, for humans, that's about like a 110 to 120 range of IQ would mm-hmm. be like their 140 to 150 IQ, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and then even further down in that sort of Einstein and, and, and Stephen Hawking's version, that's about 5% of their population. Mm-hmm. So a lot more brainiac style people. Um, what about, um, as far as what about like, you know, you talked about eyes, like what about teeth? Like, are, are they, are they meat eaters? Are they natural meat eaters or natural, like more herbivore? More herbivore. They have teeth, uh, uh, more molar style teeth. No, no canine teeth. Mm -hmm. Um, no natural weapons, so to say. That's what I was going to say. Relatively unassuming. Like I said, their biggest advantage is their willingness to stay on top. They have a tendency towards magic as well, too. They probably have a higher than average number of uh, casters. People, if you know in Gardul, I say that probably about 1% of the population is capable of using magic, um, um, like learned or magic, as we like to call it. <clears throat> and, uh, no, wait, wait. Is it, more spell, more hard uh, magic, as they like to call it. Is that, um, to, is that to say that... Anyone can learn spells, but only 1% can actually cast them. Only 1% can cast them. Yeah, anyone okay. can learn the formulas, mm-hmm. um, but you just naturally don't have the ability to, to uh, channel the magic through you to, okay. to empower it. Okay, so it is a very special thing to be able to use magic. In yes, so it's a small part of the population of the world. It's probably more like 5 to 10% in the gnomish culture. Um, they focus heavily on a couple different areas. I think one is the ability to scry. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, wow. That explains a lot. <laughs> that explains a lot. Yeah, that explains an awful lot. <laughs> and, uh, I, I, how did I not think of that? The idea of yeah. scrying. So if you're not it's familiar. Great idea. So it's it, great. They get cultural transmission of ideas to them, but they don't give any back. So if, you, if you're not familiar with the concept of scrying, the idea of scrying is to be able to look into 
a, a, a distance. So whether it be you're using some sort of portal or magic mirror or, or whatever, they can l visually or maybe, you know, three dimensionally, I don't know. It depends on how, how Jeff's guys, you, do, you know, guys do it. They can look to a different place in the world. So this would allow them exactly as you said to, to steal ideas, not trade, but take mm -hmm. and advance their technology. Cause I asked him in a prior episode, I'm like, you better have a good reason for, them to be so technologically advanced if they don't have the advantage of being in a trade route where they get to see all these Which things other the cultures are doing. Yep. Exactly. And God, I, I feel stupid for not coming up with that idea myself. What a great explanation. And, you know, that, you know, plus that, the intelligence plus uh, the additional magic, they can put lots of different resources on things as well. <laughs> plus because of the lack of contact, um, they don't get extended to wars overseas. So more of the resources get poured back into the study and progression of science, uh, which is it's, it's coupled with magic in the, you know, in, in, in their world. To that end, you could also totally justify because they sound like they'd be an extremely organized race. It would, it would be totally justifiable to have like some of them, that, you know, maybe daily or maybe every once in a while or whatever, check in on the rest of, like they might have the entire world physically mapped. They don't have to go anywhere. They can literally map out the world. They can be up on the politics of different cultures, know who's at war and be aware of danger coming. Just this is based probably on also where they came up with the idea for the Nova Special Forces teams. Sometimes in the betterment of your technology, there are resources not necessarily available. Mm. So they would need the ability to have very targeted strikes to go in and extract, um, you know, uh, silkworms or go extract uh, certain things if it's needed. If they can't come up with a, a substitution, which because of their brains and their magic, they're pretty good at doing anyway. Mm -hmm. If they can't, they do have this. And another reason why they keep keep soldiers there is to do these types of missions to go and pull back certain uh uh, uh, equipment, you know, mm -hmm. or resources, resources. Really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So, all right. Obviously they are the Jack of all trades on your planet, but they got to have some kind of limitation. Like they can't be Superman. So. Well, what? their biggest limitation is their fear of other people. So because of that, they have very strict uh, population controls on their Island. Um, you know, one, they will not spill over. They don't, they don't, they don't want to, they're afraid to leave. Mm -hmm. uh, even though they actually know where the dwarves are, they know exactly how powerful the dwarves are. Uh, the outer dwarves, not the inner dwarves. Or I'm sorry, they know where the inner dwarves are. The outer dwarves have disappeared. Mm -hmm. They don't know where they are. And that's one of the limitations is the guys who went deep underground for the dwarves are off the radar. They have no clue. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other dwarves, they know where they are. They know they're a higher tech level, but there's this, racial like phobia that they're going to come and take them over anyway, or yeah. the halflings are going to come take them over. So there's still that innate fear, which makes them very isolationist. They don't, they don't, people don't like leaving, you know, it takes very specially trained and modified types of gnomes to be able to do the extraction missions because of that, because literally you would be shuddering with fear. Mm -hmm. at the idea of setting foot off of the, outside of the range of the gnomes it reminds it's me of very limited uh, reminds me of like the u.s government experimenting on soldiers in vietnam like giving them different drugs and like you know they these gnomes might have like special psychological training or magic being used on them just mm -hmm. to get them to do what they need to accomplish on on, mm -hmm. on missions like this yeah it, it might even it's, be a uh, thing another. where it's a type of possession to where you have a gnome and safety controlling the body of a different gnome or possibly an automaton. Now, um, I, I don't know. Carry I, out the mission. I don't know if you've been taking notes on all of this so far, or if you have had uh, a moment to write a lot of the names of different things down, but just as a reminder to everybody, if you're, if you're going to go through this exercise in building a culture and coming up with the races, it's really important to write all these ideas down, mm -hmm. especially what you're going to name things because nomenclature is very important. Yes, yeah, and consistency therein, uh, which is uh, that's a cooling one. We'll go into that in some other episode. Don't don't skip over that pun. I worked on that. I I wanted to use it last episode. <laughs> Nomenclature. 
see what I did that no man because all right, never mind. Moving on. So <laughs> you guys should see the devilish grin that Jeff keeps giving me on this. Like I know that you've you've got some cool things in your head that you're not sharing, which is which is gonna be fun. Yes. Uh yeah. Uh their biggest limitation really is their size. Mm-hmm. Their their size and their really phobia of leaving their island. Um they're very strong there to the point where at this point they probably have brass cannons. Um which is another massively uh, powerful thing. Um, they have very high up in those mountains in the island. They probably have really strong defensive positions set up in case they're needed. Well, yeah, effectively at that point, you're talking art- artillery. If they had like tributaries in the up in the mountains, they could hit something so far away. <laughs> Think of more like the Ottomans with the big brass cannons. Mm-hmm. So essentially, uh, you know, if you get too close, you get within a certain range. You probably have a couple of different built-in defensive positions with our essentially like he's saying our this is early artillery. It's not really uh this isn't on the long range of like artillery today. I know. Uh, I, I'm yeah, yeah, I'm exaggerating for the tech level. Exaggerating for the tech, but for the tech level it is. I mean, you figure it was Ottoman um cannons that took down the walls of Constantinople finally. Um and that city was un could not be invaded before cannons because these were the most impressive walls ever built. And it was those cannons that, that defeated Constantinople and caused it to fall. <clears throat> so, I mean, they could, if, if they were, had the desire to, um, you know, if their mindset would completely change, which would be very hard, um, you know, they would be a very aggressive race and, and, and it would be very hard to stop, you know, because of, especially at this point with their, their tech advantage earlier on, they were more cautious in how they fought. You know, they would use diplomacy. Uh, like I said, there was a first people on this island that got driven off. Um, 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 but a lot of it was their superiority with magic. And it was uh, their willingness to just really just brutally kill people who aren't gnomes. You know, it's like they have no compunction of killing. They don't really consider you sentient. <laughs> you know, even if you could talk to them, if you're not a gnome, they really hate outsiders really hate them that's scary <clears throat> um is there anything don't, else don't hug a no i feel like we might be in for another part of this before we get to building a vehicle for them i feel like we've got more to talk about what well, do you want to do that like an actual culture build i think we need to i think we should okay I think this is going to become a four part. And, and, and some of the ideas have floated in in the last episode, and especially more in this episode. But we we could go on one step deeper, go into the culture. I, like- I think we go one step deeper. I really do, uh, because I'm thinking about stuff. But it's like, let me let me take a quick uh, look. Uh, I mean, look, we're we're almost at an hour now, and I've still yep. got a lot more to talk about this. So I a think we have to. Yeah, I think we definitely. So have actually, to. we'll make the next one. We'll we'll do a culture build on them because, like I said, I like to keep those things separate. And the reason I do is this is one bad example because really the culture, the race are all one thing. There's mm-hmm. no uh, other people from any other race that ever become a culture to, to gnomes. And, and, and if a gnome got the idea to leave and, 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 and go join a different culture, they would kill them. They'd they kill the, kill. they, the other culture would kill the gnome. Oh no, no, no. The, the gnome, gnome would go in and, and he would start them. kill the other people. Yeah. If, if you leave, there's something wrong with you. You're defective. You're defective and have to die. Uh, okay. Let me make sure I'm understanding this correctly. If a gnome left, no, if Bob, if Bob the gnome left the gnomish culture, mm-hmm. he would think of himself as defective. Uh, he, he probably wouldn't. There would probably be something that was maybe genetically different about him that allowed him to go, you know what, it'd be really interesting to go live in, in Bedrakia. So I'm going to go move there and, 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 and share and, and learn all I can and become a Bedrakian. Yay, that's my life goal. I'm going to take a ship and go. They would send out a team to kill. That's what I, I didn't quite get until a, a second before you said it. When you're saying they, you're not referring to the other race. You're referring to the gnome culture would oh, go yeah. find their exile, Bob, and kill him. Yes, yes. There's no Fair there's enough. There's no punishment of exile on the gnome. <laughs> there is no leaving. <laughs> Once you know me, never go back. Once you know. <laughs> I like it. So um, don't forget 
to uh, talk to Derek about gnomes in the Facebook group. Mm. Uh, he is a gnome aficionado. He probably knows more about them when, than we do. Yeah, um, he, he loves gnomes. Uh, Derek is also uh, the man behind uh, Seize the GM podcast. Great podcast. And definitely go check out that podcast. And the thing um, is, like, even if you're like not a full-fledged like GM gamer, but you like world building, they get into lots of really cool kind of ideas and stuff that would feed that too. I mean, it's it's really a well done show. It's a lot of fun. Um. I am trying to see if we have any new members to mention, but based on what I'm looking at in the management activity section of the site. Uh, we've had at least two. Uh, yeah, but it's just showing me the requests to join. It's not showing me the approvals. Is there some change to it? Or something I think maybe? they might have changed something. That would be annoying. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's, there's no more way to be approved. Let's see. Well, there is one, but they that that person. I know there's two, and one of them is actually a friend. So. One of them hasn't answered the questions yet. Well, the, yeah, that, I don't count the people who don't answer the questions. Um, I'll probably cut out part of this. Let's see. Edit archive group. Um, well, you I used to go to manage group to to see it. Yeah, that's. But, well, all I see is the requests though. Oh, here it is. I see it. I see it now. Okay, so okay. take a moment and so, restart that. Uh, so let's just take a quick second to uh, acknowledge some of the people who have joined the, the closed Facebook group. So if you guys want to go to um, facebook.com slash groups slash Undercroft. Mm. And uh, let's see, I think the last time, and I have notes on it here somewhere buried on my desk, but I'm not going to bother looking for them now. Uh, so I, I, I guess I'll just start with, um, I think I think we said, Welcome to Tina, but I'll start with Tina and I'll work my way up. So welcome, Tina. Uh, welcome, Isaiah. Welcome, Chris. Uh, welcome, Stephanie. And welcome, Adam. Mm-hmm. I'd say I actually met Stephanie at an event last weekend in the real world and um, super smart person. Cool. If you happen to want to learn more about uh, how to do uh, uh, bots for uh, Facebook Messenger, but I would talk to Stephanie. <laughs> She's brilliant. Um, so our world builder task is going to be a shocker, uh, build, I mean, you wrote, build a culture for your gnomes, but since we're going to do that in the next episode, well, I the think- problem was we built, had them build a race when we did the background. So now we're going to say build a background for your race. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that works for me. Start working on your, uh, if you, if you didn't build the gnomish culture, we recommended, um, then whatever race you're currently working on, flesh out your history, flesh out your, your, your traits uh, and all the characteristics of it. And we're going to get into a culture build on the next episode. Mm. What's the, uh, what's the real world task? The real world task is once again, go to facebook.com slash groups uh, slash undercroft. Yeah. I, I, I'm I actually, so excited. He already, I, I, he already I, I, I said all of these things and not, not realizing that they were the real world. Share your task. background that you just created. I'll tag in Derek so he don't miss, you know, don't, don't do it yourself. If you ask me to stop, I might actually stop because he loves it so much. He probably won't be able to get any other work done. And be cooler than Jeff and get out there and watch infinity war. Cause it hasn't made enough money. I it's want them not to, hard keep, to do that at this I, point. I, I want them to keep making movies like this. So if you guys don't go watch them, then Disney will go out of business. You will not see any more Marvel superhero movies. And I need more of that in my life. So make sure to go watch it. All right, everyone, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much for listening to the World Builders Anvil. We would love it if you would share the World Builders Anvil with two of your friends. And so would they. If they are unfamiliar with podcasts, then you get to introduce them to the wonderful world of podcasting. Take them to Stitcher or iTunes, or best of all, just send them to our website, www.gardul.com. That's G-A-R-D-U-L.com. Now strike while the myth was hot.